A radioisotope thermoelectric generator RTG, RITEG, is an electrical generator that uses an array of thermocouples to convert the heat released by the decay of a suitable radioactive material into electricity by the Seebeck effect. This generator has no moving parts. RTGs have been used as power sources in satellites, space probes, and unmanned remote facilities such as a series of lighthouses built by the former Soviet Union inside the Arctic Circle. RTGs are usually the most desirable power source for unmaintained situations that need a few hundred watts or less of power for durations too long for fuel cells, batteries, or generators to provide economically, and in places where solar cells are not practical. Safe use of RTGs requires containment of the radioisotopes long after the productive life of the unit. Notably, RTGs tend to be prohibitively expensive for most things they might otherwise find applications for. Topic history The RTG was invented in 1954 by Mound Laboratories scientists Ken Jordan and John Burden. They were inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2013. Jordan and Burden worked on an Army Signal Corps contract R65899811 SC039191 beginning on January 1, 1957 to conduct research on radioactive materials and thermocouples suitable for the direct conversion of heat to electrical energy using polonium 210 as the heat source. RTGs were developed in the U.S. during the late 1950s by Mound Laboratories in Miamisburg, Ohio, under contract with the United States Atomic Energy Commission. The project was led by Dr. Bertram C. Blank. The first RTG launched into space by the United States was SNAP 3B in 1961, powered by 96 grams of plutonium 238 metal, aboard the Navy Transit 4A spacecraft. One of the first terrestrial uses of RTGs was in 1966 by the U.S. Navy at uninhabited Fairway Rock in Alaska. RTGs were used at that site until 1995. A common RTG application is spacecraft power supply. Systems for nuclear auxiliary power SNAP units were used for probes that traveled far from the sun rendering solar panels impractical. As such, they were used with Pioneer 10 Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Galileo, Ulysses, Cassini, New Horizons and the Mars Science Laboratory. RTGs were used to power the two Viking landers and for the scientific experiments left on the moon by the crews of Apollo 12 through 17 Snap 27s. Because the Apollo 13 moon landing was aborted, its RTG rests in the South Pacific Ocean, in the vicinity of the Tonga Trench. RTGs were also used for the Nimbus, Transit and LESS satellites. By comparison, only a few space vehicles have been launched using full-fledged nuclear reactors, the Soviet ROR-SAT series and the American SNAP-10A. In addition to spacecraft, the Soviet Union constructed many unmanned lighthouses and navigation beacons powered by RTGs. Powered by strontium-90 senior, a material with potential use in a dirty bomb, they are very reliable and provide a steady source of power. Most have no protection, not even fences or warning signs, and the locations of some of these facilities are no longer known due to poor record keeping. In one instance, the radioactive compartments were opened by a thief. In another case, three woodsmen in Solangika region, Georgia found two ceramic RTG heat sources that had been stripped of their shielding, two of them were later hospitalized with severe radiation burns after carrying the sources on their backs. The units were eventually recovered and isolated. There are approximately 1,000 such RTGs in Russia, all of which have long since exceeded their design operational lives of 10 years. Most of these RTGs likely no longer function, and may need to be dismantled. Some of their metal casings have been stripped by metal hunters. Despite the risk of radioactive contamination, the United States Air Force uses RTGs to power remote sensing stations for top ROCC and Seek Igloo radar systems predominantly located in Alaska. In the past, small plutonium cells, very small 238 Pu powered RTGs were used in implanted heart pacemakers to ensure a very long battery life. As of 2004, about 90 were still in use. The Mound Laboratory Cardiac Pacemaker Program began on June 1, 1966, in conjunction with NUMEC, 3, when it was recognized that the heat source would not remain intact during cremation. The program was cancelled in 1972 because there was no way to completely ensure that the units would not be cremated with their users' bodies. <laughs> 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 
Topic: <laughs> Design. The design of an RTG is simple by the standards of nuclear technology. The main component is a sturdy container of a radioactive material, the fuel. Thermocouples are placed in the walls of the container, with the outer end of each thermocouple connected to a heat sink. Radioactive decay of the fuel produces heat. It is the temperature difference between the fuel and the heat sink that allows the thermocouples to generate electricity. A thermocouple is a thermoelectric device that can convert thermal energy directly into electrical energy, using the Seebeck effect. It is made of two kinds of metal or semiconductors that can both conduct electricity. They are connected to each other in a closed loop. If the two junctions are at different temperatures, an electric current will flow in the loop. <laughs> Fuels. Topic. Criteria for selection of isotopes The radioactive material used in RTGs must have several characteristics. Its half-life must be long enough so that it will release energy at a relatively constant rate for a reasonable amount of time. The amount of energy released per time power of a given quantity is inversely proportional to half-life. An isotope with twice the half-life and the same energy per decay will release power at half the rate per mole. Typical half-lives for radioisotopes used in RTGs are therefore several decades, although isotopes with shorter half-lives could be used for specialized applications. For spaceflight use, the fuel must produce a large amount of power per mass and volume density. Density and weight are not as important for terrestrial use, unless there are size restrictions. The decay energy can be calculated if the energy of radioactive radiation or the mass loss before and after radioactive decay is known. Energy release per decay is proportional to power production per mole. Alpha decays in general release about 10 times as much energy as the beta decay of strontium-90 or cesium-137. Radiation must be of a type easily absorbed and transformed into thermal radiation, preferably alpha radiation. Beta radiation can emit considerable gamma, X-ray radiation through bremsstrahlung secondary radiation production and therefore requires heavy shielding. Isotopes must not produce significant amounts of gamma, neutron radiation or penetrating radiation in general through other decay modes or decay chain products. The first two criteria limit the number of possible fuels to fewer than 30 atomic isotopes within the entire table of nuclides. Plutonium-238, curium-244 and strontium-90 are the most often cited candidate isotopes, but other isotopes such as polonium-210, promethium-147, cesium-137, cerium-144, ruthenium-106, cobalt-60, curium-242, americium-241 and thulium isotopes have also been studied. Topic 238 Pu Plutonium 238 has a half-life of 87.7 years, reasonable power density of 0.54 watts per gram, and exceptionally low gamma and neutron radiation levels. 238 Pu has the lowest shielding requirements. Only three candidate isotopes meet the last criterion. Not all are listed above and need less than 25 mm of lead shielding to block the radiation. 238 Pu, the best of these three, needs less than 2.5 mm and in many cases, no shielding is needed in a 238 Pu RTG as the casing itself is adequate. 238 Pu has become the most widely used fuel for RTGs, in the form of plutonium IV oxide PuO2. However, plutonium IV oxide containing a natural abundance of oxygen emits approximately 23 by 103 n, sec per gram of plutonium-238. This emission rate is relatively high compared to the neutron emission rate of plutonium-238 metal. The metal containing no light element impurities emits approximately 2.8 x 103 n, sec per gram of plutonium-238. These neutrons are produced by the spontaneous fission of plutonium-238. The difference in the emission rates of the metal and the oxide is due mainly to the alpha, neutron reaction with the oxygen-18 and oxygen-17 present in the oxide. 
The normal amount of oxygen 18 present in the natural form is 0.204%, while that of oxygen 17 is 0.037%. The reduction of the oxygen 17 and oxygen 18 present in plutonium dioxide will result in a much lower neutron emission rate for the oxide. This can be accomplished by a gas phase 1602 exchange method. Regular production batches of 238 PuO2 particles precipitated as a hydroxide were used to show that large production batches could be effectively 1,602 exchanged on a routine basis. High-fired 238 PuO2 microspheres were successfully 1,602 exchanged showing that an exchange will take place regardless of the previous heat treatment history of the 238 PuO2. This lowering of the neutron emission rate of PuO2 containing normal oxygen by a factor of 5 was discovered during the cardiac pacemaker research at Mound Laboratory in 1966, due in part to the Mound Laboratory's experience with production of stable isotopes beginning in 1960. For production of the large heat sources the shielding required would have been prohibitive without this process, unlike the latter RTG fuels, 238 Pu must be specifically synthesized and is not abundant as a nuclear waste product. At present only Russia has maintained consistent 238 Pu production, while in the US, no more than 50 grams ounces were produced in total between 2013 and 2018. The U.S. agencies involved, desire to begin the production of the material at a rate of 300 to 400 grams 11 to 14 ounces per year. If this plan is funded, the goal would be to set up automation and scale up processes in order to produce an average of 1.5 kilograms 3.3 pounds per year by 2025. Topic. 90 Senior. Strontium-90 has been used by the Soviet Union in terrestrial RTGs, 90 senior decays by beta emission, with minor gamma emission. While its half-life of 28.8 years is much shorter than that of 238 Pu, it also has a lower decay energy with a power density of 0.46 watts per gram. Because the energy output is lower it reaches lower temperatures than 238 Pu, which results in lower RTG efficiency. 90 Senior is a high-yield waste product of nuclear fission and is available in large quantities at a low price. Topic 210 Po. Some prototype RTGs, first built in 1958 by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, have used polonium 210. This isotope provides phenomenal power density pure 210 Po emits 140 with G because of its high decay rate, but has limited use because of its very short half-life of 138 days. A half gram sample of 210 Po reaches temperatures of over 500 degrees Celsius 900 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> 241 Am Americium-241 is a potential candidate isotope with a longer half-life than 238 Pu. 241 Am has a half-life of 432 years and could hypothetically power a device for centuries. However, the power density of 241 Am is only one quarter that of 238 Pu, and 241 Am produces more penetrating radiation through decay chain products than 238 Pu and needs more shielding. Even so, its shielding requirements in an RTG are the second lowest of all possible isotopes, only 238 Pu requires less. With a current global shortage of 238 Pu, 241 Am is being studied as RTG fuel by ESA. An advantage over 238 Pu is that it is produced as nuclear waste and is nearly isotopically pure. Prototype designs of 241 MRTGs expect 2 to 2.2 We per kilogram for 5 to 50 We RTGs design, putting 241 MRTGs at parity with 238 Pu RTGs within that power range. Topic 2. Lifespan Most RTGs use 238 Pu, which decays with a half-life of 87.7 years. 
RTGs using this material will therefore diminish in power output by a factor of 1 minus 0.51, 87.74, or 0.787% per year. One example is the RTG used by the Voyager probes. In the year 2000, 23 years after production, the radioactive material inside the RTG had decreased in power by 16.6%, i.e. providing 83.4% of its initial output, starting with a capacity of 470 W. After this length of time it would have a capacity of only 392 W. A related loss of power in the Voyager RTGs is the degrading properties of the bimetallic thermocouples used to convert thermal energy into electrical energy. The RT RTGs were working at about 67% of their total original capacity instead of the expected 83.4%. By the beginning of 2001, the power generated by the Voyager RTGs had dropped to 315 W for Voyager 1 and to 319 W for Voyager 2. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. NASA is developing a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator in which the thermocouples would be made of scutaridite, which can function with a smaller temperature difference than the current tellurium designs. This would mean that an otherwise similar RTG would generate 25% more power at the beginning of a mission and at least 50% more after 17 years. NASA hopes to use the design on the next New Frontiers mission. Efficiency RTGs use thermoelectric generators to convert heat from the radioactive material into electricity. Thermoelectric modules, though very reliable and long lasting, are very inefficient. Efficiencies above 10% have never been achieved, and most RTGs have efficiencies between 3 to 7%. Thermoelectric materials in space missions to date have included silicon germanium alloys, lead telluride and tellurides of antimony, germanium and silver tags. Studies have been done on improving efficiency by using other technologies to generate electricity from heat. Achieving higher efficiency would mean less radioactive fuel is needed to produce the same amount of power, and therefore a lighter overall weight for the generator. This is a critically important factor in spaceflight launch cost considerations. A thermionic converter, an energy conversion device which relies on the principle of thermionic emission, can achieve efficiencies between 10 to 20 percent, but requires higher temperatures than those at which standard RTGs run. Some prototype 210 PO RTGs have used thermionics, and potentially other extremely radioactive isotopes could also provide power by this means, but short half-lives make these unfeasible. Several space-bound nuclear reactors have used thermionics, but nuclear reactors are usually too heavy to use on most space probes. Thermophotovoltaic cells work by the same principles as a photovoltaic cell, except that they convert infrared light emitted by a hot surface rather than visible light into electricity. Thermophotovoltaic cells have an efficiency slightly higher than thermoelectric modules TEMs and can be overlaid on top of themselves, potentially doubling efficiency. Systems with radioisotope generators simulated by electric heaters have demonstrated efficiencies of 20%, but have not yet been tested with radioisotopes. Some theoretical thermophotovoltaic cell designs have efficiencies up to 30%, but these have yet to be built or confirmed. Thermophotovoltaic cells and silicon TEMs degrade faster than metal TEMs, especially in the presence of ionizing radiation. Dynamic generators can provide power at more than four times the conversion efficiency of RTGs. NASA and DOE have been developing a next-generation radioisotope-fueled power source called the Stirling Radioisotope Generator SRG that uses free piston Stirling engines coupled to linear alternators to convert heat to electricity. SRG prototypes demonstrated an average efficiency of 23%. Greater efficiency can be achieved by increasing the temperature ratio between the hot and cold ends of the generator. The use of non-contacting moving parts, non-degrading flexural bearings, and a lubrication-free and hermetically sealed environment have, in test units, demonstrated no appreciable degradation over years of operation. Experimental results demonstrate that an SRG could continue running for decades without maintenance. 
Vibration can be eliminated as a concern by implementation of dynamic balancing or use of dual opposed piston movement. Potential applications of a Stirling radioisotope power system include exploration and science missions to deep space, Mars, and the Moon. The increased efficiency of the SRG may be demonstrated by a theoretical comparison of thermodynamic properties, as follows. These calculations are simplified and do not account for the decay of thermal power input due to the long half-life of the radioisotopes used in these generators. The assumptions for this analysis include that both systems are operating at steady state under the conditions observed in experimental procedures see table below for values used. Both generators can be simplified to heat engines to be able to compare their current efficiencies to their corresponding Carnot efficiencies. The system is assumed to be the components, apart from the heat source and heat sink, the thermal efficiency, denoted eta th, is given by eta th equals Desired output Required input equals W out Q in display style eta underscore text th equals frac text desired output text required input equals frac w underscore text out Q underscore text in where primes denote the time derivative from a general form of the first law of thermodynamics in rate form delta e s y s equals q in plus w in minus q out minus w out Display style delta e caret text s y s equals q underscore text in plus w underscore text in q underscore text out w underscore text out. Assuming the system is operating at steady state and w in equals zero. Display style w underscore text in equals zero. W out equals Q in minus Q out display style W underscore text out equals Q underscore text in Q underscore text out eta th then can be calculated to be 110 W 2000 W topic 5.5 percent or 140 W 500 W 28% for the SRG. Additionally, the second law efficiency, denoted eta 2, is given by eta 2 equals eta th eta th rev display style eta underscore text 2 equals frac eta underscore text th eta underscore text th rev where eta th rev is the Carnot efficiency given by eta th equals one minus t heat sink t heat source display style eta underscore text th equals one frac t underscore text heat sink t underscore text heat source in which theta sink is the external temperature which has been measured to be 510K for the MMRTG multi-mission RTG and 363K for the SRG and theta source is the temperature of the MMRTG assumed 823K 1123K for the SRG this yields a second law efficiency of 14.46% for the MMRTG or 41.37% for the SRG Topic Safety Topic Radioactive Contamination RTGs pose a risk of radioactive contamination. If the container holding the fuel leaks, the radioactive material may contaminate the environment. 
For spacecraft, the main concern is that if an accident were to occur during launch or a subsequent passage of a spacecraft close to Earth, harmful material could be released into the atmosphere, therefore their use in spacecraft and elsewhere has attracted controversy. However, this event is not considered likely with current RTG cask designs. For instance, the environmental impact study for the Cassini-Huygens probe launched in 1997 estimated the probability of contamination accidents at various stages in the mission. The probability of an accident occurring which caused radioactive release from one or more of its three RTGs or from its 129 radioisotope heater units during the first 3.5 minutes following launch was estimated at 1 in 1,400. The chances of a release later in the ascent into orbit were 1 in 476. After that, the likelihood of an accidental release fell off sharply to less than 1 in a million. If an accident which had the potential to cause contamination occurred during the launch phases such as the spacecraft failing to reach orbit, the probability of contamination actually being caused by the RTGs was estimated at about 1 in 10. The launch was successful and Cassini-Huygens reached Saturn. To minimize the risk of the radioactive material being released, the fuel is stored in individual modular units with their own heat shielding. They are surrounded by a layer of iridium metal and encased in high-strength graphite blocks. These two materials are corrosion and heat resistant. Surrounding the graphite blocks is an aeroshell, designed to protect the entire assembly against the heat of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. The plutonium fuel is also stored in a ceramic form that is heat resistant, minimizing the risk of vaporization and aerosolization. The ceramic is also highly insoluble. Between 1961, 2011, 28 U.S. space missions safely flew radioisotope energy sources. The plutonium 238 used in these RTGs has a half life of 87.74 years, in contrast to the 24,110 year half life of plutonium 239 used in nuclear weapons and reactors. A consequence of the shorter half-life is that plutonium-238 is about 275 times more radioactive than plutonium-239 i.e. 17.3 curies 640 GBq per gram compared to 0.063 curies 2.3 GBq per gram. For instance, 3.6 kg of plutonium-238 undergoes the same number of radioactive decays per second as one ton of plutonium-239. Since the morbidity of the two isotopes in terms of absorbed radioactivity is almost exactly the same, plutonium-238 is around 275 times more toxic by weight than plutonium-239. The alpha radiation emitted by either isotope will not penetrate the skin, but it can irradiate internal organs if plutonium is inhaled or ingested. Particularly at risk is the skeleton, the surface of which is likely to absorb the isotope, and the liver, where the isotope will collect and become concentrated. There have been several known accidents involving RTG-powered spacecraft. The first one was a launch failure on 21 April 1964 in which the U.S. Transit 5 BN-3 navigation satellite failed to achieve orbit and burned up on re-entry north of Madagascar. The 17,000 c plutonium metal fuel in its SNAP-9 ARTG was injected into the atmosphere over the southern hemisphere where it burned up, and traces of plutonium-238 were detected in the area a few months later. This incident resulted in the NASA Safety Committee requiring intact re-entry in future RTG launches, which in turn impacted the design of RTGs in the pipeline. One innovative change was to transport the SNAP-27 heat source in a graphite cask on the moon lander leg and have an astronaut use a tool to remove it and insert it into the generator assembly. Alan Bean did this first on Apollo 12 with some difficulty when he didn't wait for the assembly to temperature stabilize after removing the cask cover and the resulting friction between the SNAP-27 flange and the edge of the cask cavity prevented removal at first. The second was the Nimbus B-1 weather satellite whose launch vehicle was deliberately destroyed shortly after launch on 21 May 1968 because of erratic trajectory. Launched from the Vandenberg Air Force Base, its SNAP-19 RTG containing relatively inert plutonium dioxide was recovered intact from the seabed in the Santa Barbara Channel five months later and no environmental contamination was detected. In 1969 the launch of the first Lunokhod lunar rover mission failed, spreading polonium-210 over a large area of Russia. 
The failure of the Apollo 13 mission in April 1970 meant that the lunar module re entered the atmosphere carrying an RTG and burned up over Fiji. It carried a SNAP 27 RTG containing 44,500 c 1650 TBQ of plutonium dioxide in a graphite cask on the lander leg which survived re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere intact as it was designed to do the trajectory being arranged so that it would plunge into 6 to 9 kilometers of water in the Tonga Trench in the Pacific Ocean the absence of plutonium-238 contamination in atmospheric and seawater sampling confirmed the assumption that the cask is intact on the seabed. The cask is expected to contain the fuel for at least 10 half-lives i.e. 870 years. The U.S. Department of Energy has conducted seawater tests and determined that the graphite casing, which was designed to withstand re-entry, is stable and no release of plutonium should occur. Subsequent investigations have found no increase in the natural background radiation in the area. The Apollo 13 accident represents an extreme scenario because of the high re-entry velocities of the craft returning from cis lunar space the region between Earth's atmosphere and the Moon. This accident has served to validate the design of later generation RTGs as highly safe. Mars 96 launched by Russia in 1996, but failed to leave Earth orbit, and re-entered the atmosphere a few hours later. The two RTGs onboard carried in total 200 grams of plutonium and are assumed to have survived re-entry as they were designed to do. They are thought to now lie somewhere in a northeast-southwest running oval 320 km long by 80 km wide which is centered 32 km east of Aquiqua, Chile. One RTG, the SNAP-19C, was lost near the top of Nanda Devi mountain in India in 1965 when it was stored in a rock formation near the top of the mountain in the face of a snowstorm before it could be installed to power a CIA remote automated station collecting telemetry from the Chinese rocket testing facility. The seven capsules were carried down the mountain onto a glacier by an avalanche and never recovered. It is most likely that they melted through the glacier and were pulverized, whereupon the 238 plutonium zirconium alloy fuel oxidized soil particles that are moving in a plume under the glacier. The SNAP 27 heat source traveled to the Moon in a graphite cask attached to the lander leg from which an astronaut removed it with a handling tool after a successful landing and placed it in the RTG. Many Beta M RTGs produced by the Soviet Union to power lighthouses and beacons have become orphaned sources of radiation. Several of these units have been illegally dismantled for scrap metal resulting in the complete exposure of the Senior 90 source, fallen into the ocean, or have defective shielding due to poor design or physical damage. The U.S. Department of Defense Cooperative Threat Reduction Program has expressed concern that material from the Beta MRTGs can be used by terrorists to construct a dirty bomb. Nuclear fission. RTGs and nuclear power reactors use very different nuclear reactions. Nuclear power reactors use controlled nuclear fission in a chain reaction. The rate of the reaction can be controlled with neutron absorbers, so power can be varied with demand or shut off entirely for maintenance. However, care is needed to avoid uncontrolled operation at dangerously high power levels. Chain reactions do not occur in RTGs, so heat is produced at an unchangeable, though steadily decreasing rate that depends only on the amount of fuel isotope and its half-life. An accidental power excursion is impossible. However, if a launch or re-entry accident occurs and the fuel is dispersed, the combined power output of the radionuclides now set free does not drop. In an RTG, heat generation cannot be varied with demand or shut off when not needed. Therefore, auxiliary power supplies such as rechargeable batteries may be needed to meet peak demand, and adequate cooling must be provided at all times including the pre-launch and early flight phases of a space mission. Topic subcritical multiplicator RTG Due to the shortage of plutonium-238, a new kind of RTG assisted by subcritical reactions has been proposed. In this kind of RTG, the alpha decay from the radioisotope is also used in alpha neutron reactions with a suitable element such as beryllium. This way a long-lived neutron source is produced. Because the system is working with a criticality close to but less than 1, i.e. kef. <laughs> Topic. RTG for interstellar probes 
RTG have been proposed for use on realistic interstellar precursor missions and interstellar probes. An example of this is the Innovative Interstellar Explorer 2003 current proposal from NASA. An RTG using 241M was proposed for this type of mission in 2002. This could support mission extensions up to 1,000 years on the interstellar probe, because the power output would decline more slowly over the long term than plutonium. Other isotopes for RTG were also examined in the study, looking at traits such as watt per gram, half-life, and decay products. An interstellar probe proposal from 1999 suggested using three advanced radioisotope power sources ARPS. .The RTG electricity can be used for powering scientific instruments and communication to Earth on the probes. One mission proposed using the electricity to power ion engines, calling this method radioisotope electric propulsion REP. Electrostatic boosted radioisotope heat sources A power enhancement for radioisotope heat sources based on a self-induced electrostatic field has been proposed. According to the authors, enhancements of up to 10% could be attainable using beta sources. Models. <inaudible> 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 A typical RTG is powered by radioactive decay and features electricity from thermoelectric conversion, but for the sake of knowledge, some systems with some variations on that concept are included here. Topic: <laughs> Space. Asterisk the ASRG is not really an RTG. It uses a Stirling power device that runs on radioisotope. See Stirling radioisotope generator. Asterisk asterisk the BES-5 Buck reactor was a fast breeder reactor which used thermocouples based on semiconductors to convert heat directly into electricity. Asterisk 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 the SNAP-10A used enriched uranium fuel, zirconium hydride as a moderator, liquid sodium-potassium alloy coolant, and was activated or deactivated with beryllium reflectors. Reactor heat fed a thermoelectric conversion system for electrical production. Topic Terrestrial Topic Nuclear power systems in space Known spacecraft, nuclear power systems and their fate. Systems face a variety of fates, for example, Apollo's SNAP 27 were left on the Moon. Some other spacecraft also have small radioisotope heaters, for example each of the Mars exploration rovers have a 1 watt radioisotope heater. Spacecraft use different amounts of material, for example MSL Curiosity has 4.8 kg of plutonium-238 dioxide, while the Cassini spacecraft had 32.7 kg. <laughs> See also